The following is an article titled, Scientific Publishing is a Multi-Million Dollar Ponzi Scheme, written by Alex gomez Marin, a theoretical physicist and neuroscientist, director of the Pari Center for New Learning in Italy, and, full disclosure, one of my best friends in academia. This article was originally published by the Institute of Arts and Ideas, or IAI, on the 23rd of September, 2024. Alex suggested to me the idea of using this article as a script for a Formscapes video, and I thought that was an absolutely fantastic idea, in part because this article says things that very few academics are brave enough to say out loud, and also because this article seems to serve very well as a kind of inadvertent prologue to my next video essay, which will be titled Esoteric Science, an Epistemological Manifesto. Although Alex and I didn't directly coordinate our efforts, I still feel like this article serves to raise the question which I will be attempting to answer. How did science fall so far, and what can possibly turn things around? So, without any further ado, let's get into that. Science is in trouble. The problem comes from within and from without. Not only has scientific publishing been game to advance one's career rather than everyone's knowledge, but scientific communication has turned into a mechanism of public indoctrination. We don't seem to live in a world where people can, quote, trust the experts anymore. Worrisomely, the mantra science says either means almost everything or virtually nothing to most of us today. For instance, already at year 4 AC, after COVID, some citizens would never accept unconstitutional lockdowns or experimental inoculations again, while others still drive alone in their cars with the windows up and their masks on. Something is killing science softly. What is it? How is it happening? And why? Despite relentless technological innovation, scientific progress is stalling compared to the prodigious revolutions in understanding that our ancestors provided us a century ago. We seem to have fallen into the habit of living off such scientific props, burning such a legacy and credibility quickly and unwisely. We need to transfer new funds to the science ledger, or else our scientific credentials will soon become hardly more than a pseudo-religious credo. I believe the key lies in the way that we make science public. This entails a double-stranded path. The inner route of publishing scientific results and the outer route of publicizing them. Much like in M.C. Escher's Drawing Hands, thinking and communication are a strange loop, to borrow Douglas Hofstadter's phrase namely a self-referential, paradoxical system. Knowledge circulates via peer-reviewed publications within the walls of academia. Then, outside the Citadel, we do science outreach, which in turn directs public attention and funding to certain topics and ways of doing science back to academia. Both routes are severely compromised. First, science publishing has become a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme, at the expense of taxpayers and scientists themselves. Top journals charge obscene fees to publish results already paid for by those taxpayers in the form of grants, while we scientists peer-review those very journals for free. Moreover, such reviews tend not to be the critical, objective, and dispassionate appraisals of the work one might think they are, especially when results threaten the dominant worldview or simply one's tiny conceptual condominium or scientific business niche. The line between editorial curation and censorship is thin, or rather dashed. In a similar vein, our peers aren't often truly so, since we are not people of equal expertise, interests, values, agenda, standing, or power. The so-called scientific community is more of a euphemism for an actual scientific hierarchy of castes. Yes, personal ambition can drive discovery, and we certainly want credit for our ideas and work, but it's the hunger games of academia here. Publish, or, and perish. 
we used to want to understand nature, but now our main concern is to understand how to publish in nature. Not to speak of the bureaucratic mind virus that has drained the vital force of our institutions, which in turn have betrayed us and are crumbling. How can science possibly continue to progress in this way? Second, science journalism has become a significant part of the problem it was supposed to be a solution to. Let us dwell on this and dive into some rough seas. There are no doubt great communicators of various sorts in the media landscape, but some of the most notorious ones have steadfastly slanted towards promoting what could be called the public misunderstanding of science. Such professionals do not exemplify what they profess. They substitute certitude for curiosity. They throw stigma upon enigma. They conflate their myopic and dogmatic views of science with the science. They transmute a kind of inferiority complex into a superiority contest, making science digestible at the expense of making us swallow their covert ideologies. It is shameful, pathetic, and detrimental to us all. You probably know who I'm talking about without indulging in specific examples, but if you don't, lucky you and stay tuned. Such psychom gurus and their minion wannabes blogging and trolling from their couches conflate scientific outreach with scientific outrage. They hunt academic dissenters down and bully good-spirited amateurs. They think of themselves as the self-appointed arbiters of fact versus fiction, dismissing people's exceptional experiences as illusions, delusions, or hallucinations. You are either crazy or simply stupid, in other words. They have a blast ridiculing half-witted flat-earthers, fundamentalist creationists, and lovely old ladies who believe in spirits, but they would not survive a round of debate with a grown-up heterodox intellectual. Similarly, they flippantly challenge frail positions but never dare to go after the big fish of the status quo. In other words, big pharma is your friend, but acupuncturists are the ones who are dangerous. Curiously, they love the feeling of telling you that science does not care about your feelings. As it turns out, their science is true whether or not you believe in it. Say hi, you have finally met your new master class indoctrinator. Confusing solemnity with seriousness, they make fools of themselves as John Cleese brilliantly illustrates here. Link in the description. But that's not all. At the risk of being scathingly clear, let me continue to say out loud what plenty of my colleagues have to think in silence. The self-aggrandized middlemen of science TM are too quick to tell the public and other scientists what they can and cannot believe in, investigate, or even entertain. They don't bother to read the literature of those genuine subject matter experts, the pioneers who have been at the real cutting edge of science for decades. It is so wonderful to be a skeptic of everything except your own beliefs. Why spend the time checking the data if the phenomenon is impossible in principle? It is one thing to be dogmatic, but another to be lazy, and being both is surely too much. They say they would change their minds, as they should say, but they know they won't. Their priors about the potential reality of certain important phenomena are so infinitesimally small that any Bayesian update of their beliefs upon new evidence, no matter how extraordinary, is chimeric. To cover that up, they are used to posing the two alternative forced choice between their body of authorized truths or science denialism. It's their way or the highway, but dilemmas betray trilemmas. There is life beyond real fakes and fake reals. So, how did science become so unscientific? To make a long story short, we have been sold a triple pseudo-intellectual flimflam for decades. If you want to be a respectable homo academicus, then you must embrace the unholy trinity of mechanistic reductive materialism, plus skepticism in its most dogmatic declination, and finally secularism in the mode of viciously naive atheism. In a word, scientism has been institutionalized in the name of science, but in the end, 
scientism is more dangerous than pseudoscience because it is an inside job. Error, bias, and hype are minor sins compared to scientific hubris. Arrogance is antithetical to progress. The distinguished professors of the public pulpitry of science have done a huge disservice not only to science itself but to the humanities and to humanism writ large by strawmanning philosophy and disdaining religion. Much like priests, however, they anoint themselves in the transmission chain of revelation. Paraphrasing a Freudian Morpheus, the return of the repressed, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. If God is dead, then zombie new atheists have ushered in a walking dead society. They first prune nature of wonder and then wonder how to reinfuse it with sham awe and the farcical wonderment at the astounding improbability of being alive. Beating irrationalism with unreasonableness, the limping horsemen of Puritan reason have revealed themselves more like imposter truth keepers than indomitable truth seekers. If I may coin a word, they have misscienced reality. But there are silver linings. A growing wide range of independent young people, from Kurt Jai Mungle to Keelan Morgan, to name two of my favorite ones, are acting as coronary stents to the as yet narrow conduits of ideas. Some senior intellectuals and producers, such as Robert Lawrence Kuhn and Jeffrey Mishlove, have been transfusing insights into the zeitgeist lifeblood for decades. And then we have Joe Rogan, the mothership, or rather, death star of Real Talk. Note how his recent conversation with Terence Howard caused outrage amongst the intellectual elites. Mentioning certain ideas can cause in them the entertaining entails endorsing entails endangering freak out chain reaction in their pasteurized intellects. Very few can walk the tightrope between woo woo and poo poo. Eric Weinstein and Gary Nolan are some of those rare but much-needed funambulists within the real circus of science. To conclude, let me add something important. The double strand mentioned above, outreach and inreach, is in fact a triple helix. One must include education, pre-reach, to make the assessment complete. Education really needs reforming too, as it has literally become a schooling system to proselytize minds from a very young age. In fact, future scientists are the most indoctrinated of all since most checkpoints in the stairway to academic heaven, from undergraduate students to postdoctoral researchers to tenured professors, select for such failings and implant us with an operating system stuck in our 19th century understanding of the world. The problem is deep, as it is entrenched in the triangular industrial complexes of academia, journalism, and education. In some, scientistic televangelism is alienating genuine truth seekers, eroding public trust in science, and indoctrinating young minds. Let us reject such terms of disservice and reverse the dead ending of science from within and without. The truth is that true experts don't know the truth. Nobody really knows what is going on. We live in a wild, weird, wonderful world. The scientists of the future need intellectual humility, epistemic vulnerability, and metaphysical sincerity. We also need true collegiality, individual bravery, and, of course, fuck you money. We need to wake up, stand up, and call the bullshit out. Let us practice a different game and tell a different story. Let us yearn for the truth and tell it to the best of our ability. The time is ripe. We are pilgrims towards the unknown, not squatters of the familiar or broken records of ideological mantras. We can excel at the theater of ideas while being honest about what is going on at the backstage of science. We need more Jai Mungles, Morgans, Coons, Mishloves, Nolans, and Weinsteins, and fewer Krabby Dawkins, Trickster Randys, and Cocksure DeGrasse Tysons. Preaching dogma in the name of science is a dagger at the heart of society. Alex Gomez Marin